There we go. I would like to introduce Roxanne Nakamura. Uh, Roxanne has uh, been a master gardener um, for a number of years with us here in Cowlitz County and certainly has a great expertise with plants and native plants, which I know is a really nice passion with her. And so um, she's here in the office. So I'm going to slowly move the screen and let you see Roxanne. So with that, Roxanne, I'm going to turn it over to you. And Hi, everybody. Can you hear Roxanne okay? Somebody give me a thumbs up, a wave, or something so we know. Or say yes or whatever. Yes. Yes. No. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, you know, um, I'm not a professional speaker, and this is the first Zoom I've done, so I'll try to make it as smooth as possible. Uh, I've got lots to say. Like Gary said, uh, you can get a, a copy of the presentation because I won't read the slides. You'll be able to uh, look up information, um, and hopefully, in fact, speaking of le looking up information, you can um, find out more on the internet about any plant that you are interested in. Um, uh, let's see. This, this presentation is for native plant lovers, but it's also for anybody that gardens or has property. And um, what I'd like to say is that when, when, uh, when you're seeing uh, this presentation, keep in mind that these are to incorporate in your landscape. I, I don't expect that you will um, have all natives only in your, in your yard, but um, just pick and choose the ones that um, you use. And there's a lot of plants that I'm not mentioning here too, a lot of flowers. And at the end, I'll, I'll uh, show you some, some books that might be useful to you that I've found are really helpful. Um, let's see. It's not. Okay, so, so the reason we use um, native plants, they've been around for thousands of years as far as we know, and uh, they are better adapt, they are, uh, have evolved with the soils and climate and other natural controls. So um, they, they'll be easier for you to work with in your landscape, actually less ma maintenance. And um, I'll tell you, uh, one thing about this that helps out is that when, uh, when you use uh, plants from other areas and uh, introduce plants, uh, sometimes they don't have the natural controls that native plants do, and um, they can, they can uh, be aggressive, and uh, most of the, the invasive plants in our area are actually plants that have been introduced. You might be familiar with blackberries. Pardon? Uh, you might be familiar with uh, blackberries and uh, scotch broom, um, things like that, that um, are unwelcome visitors now. And uh, next next week, there's going to be a talk on noxious weeds. I'll just mention a couple things. Uh, Class A noxious weeds in Washington are ones that we've seen here, but we're trying to keep from becoming a problem here and get keeping them from becoming established. Class B would be plants that uh, have uh, become established in some um, counties, but we're trying to keep them from spreading to other parts of the state. And then Class C would be, yeah, they're here, and we're just going to do our best to keep them under control and keep them from spreading. So. But with native plants, you don't have to worry about that so much. There are a few that uh, do spread and um, can be aggressive in different uh, locations. But in your garden, um, you'll you have a better um, control over them, weeding and, and cutting off uh, flower seed heads and things like that if you need to. Um, Animals and birds and insects have all co-evolved with, with native plants as well. And they all work together in uh, various ecosystems. And it's important to them that they have the native because 
um, I think the next slide shows it. Well, here's some um, native plant purposes. They, they belong here and they are beautiful. You'll find that um, native plants are just as beautiful as cultivars, um, plants that have been developed genetically and are available in the nurseries. Um, they, the native plants can also serve most of the, well, pretty much all the landscape functions that you would want in your yard, like screens and shade and flowers and um, edibles. The lower picture is a picture of the elderberry, which is really popular now. A lot of people are planting it. And the upper picture is big leaf lupin. I'll mention that later. Um, the, uh, when I first started with native plants, I got interested in it because I was wondering where bees live, you know, the native bees. And I found out how interesting it is that they depend on native plants, both for nesting and for their uh, food. Um, bees, uh, as an example, they use the pollen to feed their young and um, the nectar to feed themselves when they're working. And also, like the elderberry, if you cut off the uh, stems in late summer, there are bees that actually use the, the stems to nest in for the winter, to overwinter. Um, this, this is another reason for using native plants, because they are best at, at uh, reclaiming the natural world and, and saving our globe. Um, there is a movement called 30 by 30 movement that I've just learned about that's really exciting. Um, if we conserve 30% of the land and 30% of the Earth's water, then we can protect 75% of the Earth's species. Um, there are 200 to 2,000 species in the world that uh, go extinct every year. And so it's really important for us to do our part to save as many as we can. When you plant native plants, you are conserving the land with uh, erosion control, um, covering the the earth with uh, plant material, plants um, feed mycorrhizae. Mycorrhizae is a type of fungus that lives in the soil and the plants feed the mycorrhizae and actually the mycorrhizae move the, the um, minerals and nutrients from the soil, from the bacteria and that sort of thing up into the plants so that they can grow. It's, uh, it has to happen. Those have to be in place and sequestering carbon in plants. So you might think of a, a wooded forest. Uh, every every uh, piece of wood is a storage unit for carbon that comes from the air. And um, soil does the same thing. Uh, mycorrhiza and other microorganisms are in almost every soil in the world. And um, they sequester as much as plants do, which is pretty amazing. And by nurturing biodiversity, we can um, make natural ecosystems that support everything, supports its, each other. And that will also um, make plants healthier, cover the world more, and ensure that we have clean air and water. Birds depend on native plants. They're, they also they find that the, the um, fruits of native plants are actually more nutritious than plants that, that we get from the nurse, nurseries. And um, the migratory birds depend on the native plants. They recognize them. They, they find refuge. They rest. They uh, feed on the plants as they move from one part of the world to the other. And so it's really important, even in urban areas and cities, you can incorporate um, native plants and just a few, in fact, you can make a difference because they, they need um, to find something in the, in the uh, native plant deserts of the 
urban areas. Um, if we have grass, we have to mow it, and we use um, blowers, and all that noise is just deafening to birds, and it will affect their ability to rest and nest and mate and feed because they're, they're distracted and they're scared. And so one of the things that I want to want to uh, emphasize with this is that to to make less grass and noise and pollution, um, it's important to reduce the um, amount of grass in your yard. Also, by doing that, you make more room for your plants. Um, and the um, when when you're planting native plants, you want to make sure that you leave enough room um, around the the um, the plants so that they can get to their normal size. You'll see that some of the shrubs are pretty big in this picture. Trees take up room, and um, as you plant, the first plants would be the trees and shrubs. As they grow, you can um, bring out the beds further to make room for other plants. And um, <clears throat> I guess it's all I need to say about here. I'm <clears throat> so this one here shows that um, you can you can really make a beautiful landscape with natives. Now all of these are natives, and you can see hostas in here and some other things. But but you'd be amazed at how many of them can be natives. Now, there are concerns about using native plants. Um, the, um, some of the concerns of people that don't, aren't sold on them yet is that they may think that they can't do what regular plants do. And regular, I mean by plants that you find in the nursery, petunias and, and uh, crab apples, um, you know, the cultivars. Cultivar means that it's been uh, developed genetically for uh, choosing certain um, characteristics that we like. Now, native plants can offer the beauty with color and form. Um, you can make uh, large shrubs into small trees, beautiful ones, and um, they also offer fruit. Um, they attract the beneficial insects that um, work in our uh, vegetable gardens and um, they, they fight the pests in our yard, and then the birds and butterflies are something that people really want in their yard, and the more native plants you have, um, the more you'll have them. Wild plants make messy landscapes. You might think that they have a wild shape to them and, you know, dead stuff in them, but just like any, any landscape, there's some, there's some maintenance, but you'll find that there's not as much maintenance when you're um, when the plants are growing in their natural form and size, and you can do some light trimming, and that's that's the best way to take care of a native plant to make it look clean and neat and tidy in your yard. Plants are hard to find and expensive is another concern. Um, you might have uh, found this in the past years that. Um, they weren't available, <clears throat> but more nurseries are carrying them now, uh, and there's more demand for them. So I think that the the uh, supply is just going to grow and grow. There, are, so you can find them in nurseries, and you can also uh, get plants from organizations that are um, trying to get more native plants out into the world. Um, there are. I've, <coughs> I've uh, grown a lot of natives now, and I started first with um, uh, soil and water conservation district plant sales that happen once a year, and you order the plants online and then pick them up when it's time to plant them. So that's the way to uh, look for plants. If you have a plant list, um, you can you can uh, check with different nurseries, and you'll you'll be surprised at how many of them do carry some natives, which gives you an excuse to, you know, explore. When, you, um, when you're uh, 
buying plants, start with young ones, um, and it's the best way for them to get established in your yard. Sometimes they're the only ones available, but also a lot of plants, if you start young, they you, you save money that way. And you can grow your own. You can propagate your own through seed. Um, there are sources online. One thing I'll say about that, though, is if you buy seed from um, across the country, you might find that they offer plants that are noxious here. Baby's breath, and I even saw on one site that they were selling Canada thistle as a native plant. So, so make sure, you know, look up and make sure that it's not, not an noxious weed. And another point is that when you buy plants online, um, if it's coming mail order from across the country, it could be that it's the same species of something that grows here na natively, and it may be native there too, but it's grown in um, their own soil and climate, so it may not do as well here. Most often it won't, and I've been disappointed when I buy plants online too. They're just so tiny. <laughs> And the root systems aren't, as, you know, very good. So anyway, those are some ways to um, can, can uh, plant plants now and uh, let them grow. You need to be patient with plants because um, for the first two years, they um, are establishing their roots, and then they'll take off and put on flowers and grow. Now, um, this slide shows a diagram of a landscape. And it could be um, retail plants or it could be native plants. I, I'm making the distinction just because most retail plants are cultivars. But the first thing you want to do when you're thinking about doing native plants or any landscape is to draw a map or a diagram of where you're going to be planting, whether it be your uh, property, your full property, or your backyard and um, keep it to scale, you know, it should be wider than it is longer if it is in real life, and then mark the areas that you want certain uh, purposes to be met, like uh, screens and color and shade and that sort of thing. And then um, when you're looking at native plants or any plants, um, Make sure that you plant the trees and large shrubs first because they're going to take longer to grow and you want them to uh, start making shade for some of your plants. And um, one thing that I've heard is that uh, the best time to plant a tree is 10 years ago. And the second best time to plant a tree is now. So keep that in mind. Um, this is a board of planting um, that uh, is established. I don't know how old it is, but I just think it's beautiful because it's got the different layers. It's got evergreens and um, perennial flowers and uh, the forest grass that you see um, grow, dies down to the ground. It's deciduous, but then it comes each spring. A lot of these do, but um, you know, mix in some ferns and things that are evergreen and, and you'll have a landscape year-round. Here's a, here's a sample of uh, um, different uh, challenges that people have met with, uh, with uh, stone and with plants that are naturally growing in those areas. So you can see that uh, on the right-hand side, it's a steep slope. It's probably pretty dry. At least it's got good drainage, well <laughs> drained. Um, and so you, you would use different plants than on the left. But there are so many choices that you can use. Um, it's, it's good to look at the, the growing conditions of the plant, where it grows in the wild, um, so that you um, match that in your yard so they're happiest that they can be. You wouldn't want to grow um, a drought-loving uh, plant over on the left where it's a lusher, um, probably has more rain and may even have standing water if it wasn't a slope. So now when you're planting uh, flowers, plant them in groups um, so that you have, what I learned is that you, you have at least a four foot grouping of a flower 
That way, the, the birds and the bees can notice it and come to it. And then they don't have to work so hard to flit around to different parts of your yard to get one over there and one over there. It will um, be, it'll be easier for them to see. Um, visual impact is in a real important part of that, too. And in terms of planting in groupings, I also want to say that when you group plants, you use plants that grow together in the wild like uh, conifer trees, like uh, have uh, salal and Oregon grape under them. And they really do look best if they have part shade, even though they say they'll grow in the sun. And it just looks more, I um, can't think of the word, not contiguous, but it's, um, it's more um, things go together better and, and look complete if you have different layers of plants that grow together. Now I'm going to move into uh, pictures of plants to give you an idea of what you might see and uh, plants you might want to have. Um, to start with, uh, small trees. I've, I've left out the big trees just because um, most, most yards in urban areas, not all, but most, um, don't have the huge conifers and big leaf maples and things. So small trees fit better. And a lot of these can be used on the street, either um, on the parking strip, some of them, and in your front yard so that it doesn't block your house. Now, this is a flowering dogwood. This is the native one here. And um, it's really best if you let it do its thing with having, you know, multiple stems to it. It's got pretty bark. And... Uh, the white flowers actually bloom in April and May, which is the same time that the salmon run, the spring salmon run. And um, a fisherman uh, use it as a sign. It's kind of their signal that it's time to get out there. It grows in um, conifer forest. It says west of the Cascades. So it's used to at least winter rain. I will say that when you're planting these things, even on the west side that likes rain, most of the, well, the native plants are acclimated and have evolved to withstand the heat and drought of July and August that we have here. And a lot of the, the um, cultivars, you have to water like crazy in those months. Once you get a native established, it'll be okay. So that will make things easier for you and save water. Mountain ash is a really good tree for uh, feeding the birds. The berries stay on um, in the wintertime, and they're not the first berries that they come to, so they're going to be there when other foods aren't there, and you really need them for that purpose. Um, don't eat them yourself because they'll make you sick. And um, they're, they're just really pretty trees. They have white flowers and um, orange fruit, so it's really bright. Cascara is a new favorite of mine. It's just got beautiful leaves on it. I don't know if you can tell for the, with this, but uh, it's got glossy, deep green leaves. You can see that there's a little blue tint to it. That, that shows through, too. And uh, it makes a, a small tree. The bark is pretty, so you may even use this one um, next to the sidewalk um, so that you can see the, the bark and, and the, the foliage close up and the berries. It's really uh, a clean tree, uh, so it's tidy. And uh, if, you, if you do have a slope, this will hold your soil in place as well. By maple, we all know this one, I'm sure. Um, in the, in the uh, conifer forest where it, it grows, um, it has long, slender stems on it. That's where the vine comes from. It's not a vine. It just has slender stems, and it's just so graceful. And it has horizontal levels to the, to the leaves that are, uh, if you see them uh, as you cross over Mount Hood, you'll just really appreciate them. On the um, north side of the road, now, on the south, they're getting the sun, and in this lower picture, you can see that they, they turn some colors in the sun, so, so um, you can plant it in different places for different effects. It's going to be bushier in the sun, and the fall color is brilliant. 
if it's in the shade, it's going to be more of a light yellow color that's really soft and pretty. Um, it doesn't grow real tall, and um, they, it doesn't look like much the flowers. They're little red flowers on the, in the spring, early spring, and the bees and even the hummingbirds will um, use the nectar from this, and a ma another maple that they use a lot of is big leaf maple. You may never see the uh, flowers on it, but boy, you can hear the buzzing, and, um, and you know, uh, birds get fed that way too. <laughs> um, so I really like this plant. Um, Saskatoon serviceberry. I know there's a lot of writing on here. You might want to look it up later when you get the, the copy of the presentation. But um, it's, it's, the serviceberry grows all, the, all across the north, northern states and in Cali or, uh, Canada. And so you can tell that it's a very hardy plant to cold and, um, and weather of any sort. Um, the one that grows here, the Amelanchier alnifolia, actually um, is the tastiest of them all, I've heard. So um, go, grow the native, and you'll like it even better. Um, this is in the apple family. You might see that there's five petals on the white flower down there. And this blooms in June. The fruit is actually related more to an apple and has pectin in it. So use it in your jams and pies and things like that. And it tastes a little appley, a little nutty. Um, it's got a little, lot of little seeds in it. So strain some of those out when you're, when you're uh, making the jams and things. You can see that it makes a graceful tree, but it also makes a large shrub, um, just like elderberry. This, this is madrone. Um, you'll see that if, once you start uh, seeing the flowers and the leaves, and maybe you might not notice the trunk at first, but you will see that they're all over. They're, they're all up and down I-5. Um, I first noticed them just beautiful down in southern Oregon on I-5. And um, they, they grow on slopes. They like moisture, but they are drought tolerant. And uh, so they, they can grow in thin soils as well. It doesn't get real big, though it's bigger than some of the others that I've shown. Um, the leaves are pretty in the summer and in the winter even. Um, they're dark green. They look like magnolia leaves. Um, one thing I'll tell you, though, about I have a madrone, and it, it gets a black spot in late winter, but and so the leaves turn black. <laughs> but that goes away pretty quick. Once the new growth comes on, you don't see it anymore. So it, it's only there for a little while. So I would say put this in the back corner where you can see the structure and uh, watch the birds with berries, and um, maybe let the leaves fall or pick them up. They're leathery, so they don't break down real fast. They're good cover for the insects and small animals that, that live in leaf litter. Um, but if you don't like it, you know, just sweep them up um, in the springtime. So this, this plant um, also grows with uh, Sal Owl and Oregon Grape. I have a book that I got from WSU that uh, you might want. I think it's $15, 10 or $15. It's a spiral bound book that has uh, plants that go together in different ecosystems. And it's a really good resource for planting your native plants. Got to put in the Pacific rhododendron. Now there's rhododendrons all across the country, but this is ours. Uh, this one grows in, um, on the coast in California as well, so it's got a California name too. It gives, does get big, big in shade, um, but in the sun it's going to be more compact. I've seen it as low as 5 feet, but it's really more around 10 feet tall, and it can get to 24 if you really wanted it to. Um, the flowers bloom uh, April to July, which is a pretty long time actually, so, you know, they'll just continue. The, um, the buds are really pretty pink. Sometimes the flowers are white, but most of them are pink. And um, it grows mostly in uh, moist areas. Um, 
in your yard, it can take some dryness. You don't have to water it really that much. Maybe once every couple weeks in the summer, and it'll make more flowers in the spring. It does like a load of nitrogen, so don't put a lot of fertilizer around it. That'll save you money that you're not using fertilizer. Um, now, more uh, and more landscapers are using these in, in uh, plantings because they're so graceful and, and um, not as gaudy as some others. You may like them both ways. Um, it is toxic, so you can be assured that the deer won't eat them. They might take one nibble and they'll be done. They're not going to die, but they don't want to eat them. And it also grows on slopes, and the roots will uh, hold the soil in place. Um, nine bark is another fun one. Uh, it makes pom-poms uh, that are about two inches, one inch, two inch uh, diameter. And um, this plant here you see has le been left to grow totally the way it wants to. Now you can trim off those uh, long ends right after it blooms and it will be a more shapely plant. You can even use this as a specimen by pruning up the bottom, small tree, that sort of thing. It's uh, also uh, from riparian woodlands, which means that they're, they're damper. Um, but um, just like the rhododendrons, they can take the, the dryness too. More dry in shade than, and in fact, I have mine in the woodland walkway that I have, and uh, it blooms well, and it's um, adapted to the dry shade of my maples. Also berry is one of the first things you see in spring. It's, um, it's more a, a large shrub than a tree, though I guess you could trim it up. Um, it puts down uh, tassels of flowers above those leaves that point up. It just is so graceful and pretty. And it's a, a loose uh, plant in that it's not like a, a it's not going to form a ball or anything dense. And um, so just plant it with some other shrubs and it'll show up in the spring and and give you some beauty just when you're anxious for spring to start, it will come. And that's good for the early bees. Um, they need food as they're emerging. And actually hummingbirds like them too. The fruit is edible, but it's got a big seed in it. So it's maybe not worth the work, but they're pretty and the birds eat them. So that's a good thing. Now we're going on to some shrubs. This is uh, California uh, waxleaf myrtle, and it, it's actually from southern Oregon along the coast in California, but it grows here just fine. And if you let it, it's going to get about 10 feet tall, maybe a little taller, and it would spread to eight feet wide, but you can see that they've selectively pruned so that it will, you don't take a head shear to it, but you know, just cut off the branches that are going the wrong, you know, out further than you want, and it'll make a really nice screen for you. It grows on the coast, so it's used to wind and um, salt in the breeze. So um, when you use a hedge or screen, it's, it's nice to have a backdrop for all the color that you have to uh, really show off the, the brightness of other things. Evergreen huckleberry can be used as a low hedge as well. Um, you know, it's got the edible fruit that everybody uh, grows the plant for, it seems like. The new growth you can see on top, it, it grows about as half, half the height of this picture, and the new growth on top is a rosy color that adds another seasonal interest to it. And um, the, uh, just like all the plants here, it seems, they, the flowers are really good for bees and, and um, hummingbirds. Now, the bees that I'm talking about aren't honeybees necessarily. Native bees are, um, uh, they, they don't make hives. They, they live on their own. And so they don't have a hive to defend. So they're not as um, they, uh, aggressive as honey honeybees. Um, I've, I've worked real close around shrubs with bees in them, and 
I've never been touched. Just be gentle, move slow, and um, enjoy the buzz and know that you're doing the environment a lot of good. Now, this has already been great. It's actually um, the state flower of Oregon, and you can see here why. Washington got uh, rhododendron. Um, maybe it got it first, I don't know. <laughs> But anyway, um, Oregon grape is another one that just buzzes with happy bees in the springtime. And it blooms for quite a while, too. And then it puts on um, blue fruit, that it, a dark brew um, that's very tart. Birds like it, too. You can see the cedar waxwings. I mean, that's a special bird. Now, salal kind of grows the same way, though it's not going to be... The Oregon grape is more upright canes, and huckleberry, or uh, uh, salal, is more, um, uh, grows sideways, I guess you'd say. So you can trim it, but um, it's not going to be a tight shrub like the one, like the Oregon grape you just saw. It's evergreen, and it puts on pretty little um, light pink bells in the spring, and then the berries are sweet. And um, you can mix the sweet berries of salal with the tart berries of Oregon grape, and it makes a delicious um, dessert. Um, and the, and the indigenous peoples use these together a lot. Um, what else? You know, both, both Oregon grape and salal grow in conifer forests or even deciduous forests, but so they're used to um, shade, part shade, and they look their best there. But you can grow both of them in uh, full sun. They'll bloom and be, be fuller if you give them occasional watering. Moth orange is another beauty. Um, it, you can see that it's got that gold blush in the center of it um, that really shows up from a distance. And um, it's a dense shrub. Uh, large shrub, 10 to 15 feet high, and give it its space because um, it makes the flowers on the new growth. Now you can cut off the um, the the wild uh, branches if you have any, or you want to keep the size a little a little bit down um, right after it blooms. Then let it do its thing and make the flowers so that it'll bloom in the spring for you. Um, you know moths are a pollinator that do a better job even than butterflies. And they are attracted to light colored flowers like this one and fragrant. I, I don't think the native moth orange has quite as much scent as the cultivar. Grow either one and they'll make the moths happy. Um, but this is, this is an example of a plant that can really give you some, some spring color. Red flowering currant is the first one that sells out at any native plant sale uh, because of its pretty red flowers in the spring. And um, the um, shrub gets bigger than you might think. You see pictures of it about five or six feet high, tall as a person. But it'll get bigger. It'll get eight feet tall and uh, almost that wide. So keep that in mind when you plant it. See, they, they made room for their... Um, flowers and things underneath it, and that's a way that you can incorporate it and still have a lot of bed for other things. Um, of course, the hummingbirds like this because they, the flowers are kind of tubular, but it doesn't make fruit and it doesn't have thorns. Ocean spray, you'll see this on the sides of the road too, and you know, I mentioned too, when, when I'm driving around and I see these plants that I recognize, I feel like um, I'm part of nature, even if I'm in a car, because I notice things that are friends. I consider plants friends that I know. <laughs> and so keep an eye out for these things. Now, this one here makes uh, tan seed heads out of these pretty flowers. And so you can cut those off or leave them for the birds. They like the seeds. So um, it, can, it can get big here, too. Um, let's see what else. Native bees like it. This is another one that moths are attracted to because it has a, a little bit of a scent to it. 
Uh, Douglas Byria is one native. There are two natives that I'll mention here. This is one of them that will spread and uh, from seed or from underground, and it'll pop up a uh, little ways from where it's planted and make a colony. So keep it confined or just um, or let it go. I pull up some of the sprouts if they're, they go into an area that I don't want them to. And, and that works really well. It's pretty easy to control, just to keep that in mind. It does like moisture, but um, you know, it, grow, it grows along creeks and things. You might see it there along the rivers. And, um, but my, I have a batch in uh, full sun, hot, dry sand, and it's doing great. So um, the flowers give you um, color in the summer, in the hot months when some other things will fade. And it gives food to the, to the pollinators um, when nothing else will. This is another one that uh, I'll just mention. Um, it's a pretty plant. This is from Central Oregon. And uh, so is this. This is golden currant or clove currant because it smells kind of clovish. Oh my gosh, the smell on this is so sweet and wonderful. And it's pretty strong. So put it um, near where you'll walk in the spring. And the berries are good. Um, they're, they're not big. They're like a quarter inch big, but they're juicy and sweet. And um, five feet, no spines. Snowbrush is another one that is from Central Oregon and, um, and Southern Oregon and Northern California where it's dry and hot. And um, the leaves are glossy green, evergreen, and um, it, it puts on lots of flowers. It'll give you a big show. Now, this is a flower of uh, perennial. Just threw it in because it's from Central Oregon. And, you're, and we're seeing more and more of it. In fact, uh, um, you see it in a picture for a uh, um, weather guy that shows this in the background on one of these pretty pictures. And um, it grows on the hills in central Oregon. Since we're having climate change and warmer and warmer, it's a good idea to start thinking about um, plants from, that era, from the east side of the mountains because they'll adapt to the our area when it's hot and dry as well. And in fact, when you're looking at plants that grow in the mountains, you might want to reconsider because as it gets warmer, you know, we're pushing the envelope by having them in our area because they like the cool um, and they may not grow as well when things get warmer and warmer. Blue elderberry, I won't talk too much about that. It's a, it's a fun plant to have and it's big. In fact, um, the white flowers, um, I heard a, a talk saying that she makes um, a kind of a champagne drink with, with bubbles in it um, from, the, from the flowers because they have yeast in, in them and make bubbles. You can leave it for a while. Red elderberry sometimes is um, confused with this. It grows more in the shade while the blue one or black one grows in the sun more. And um, uh, it's, it's really controversial if it's edible or not. I, I, I don't know. It's up to you, but I would stay safe. Um, it does like moisture. And so does red, red twig dogwood, red osha dogwood. It grows in low areas in central Oregon where there's moisture. Um, it does really well around here. You'll see it as a cultivated plant a lot. If you... Cut it down to the ground, you're going to get more red because it does that on the, on the young twigs. If you leave it as it is, it'll be brown at the bottom, the wood will. Um, but it's a pretty plant and um, the flowers aren't much to speak of. It's a dogwood, but it doesn't make flowers to look at. Um, but they do help the birds and bees. This is another one um, that likes the moisture. And it's a, it's a fleabane, a ridgeron, um, which is different than some of the other asters that you may, that look like it. 
This one is for moisture, and some of the asters are for drier. I'm only going to show one uh, picture of a flower like this, but you can you can look for the ones that do better in your in your conditions. Um, showy milkweed is the butterfly plant for monarchs, and um, we don't see monarchs around here very much. Uh, but but you know if we can plant enough of them, hopefully they'll come. There have been a few seen in Portland. Uh, the last few years, so, and it's a beautiful plant. It has uh, grayish leaves to it. It's about um, three feet high, sometimes four, I guess. And uh, the flowers are just really cool. I hope you can see that in this picture. Now, it will put up uh, plants far, even far away from the plant that you plant. And I like that because uh, my garden is always evolving, as all gardens do. You'll, you'll, you know, a plant will disappear and another one will take its place and just accept that, that, um, that things change over time. And if you have a, a, a milkweed come up among the manzanita that you have, it looks great. Checker mallow is uh, becoming more well known. It's a tall plant. It makes a, a bushy plant and it can be woody and stay there year round. Um, I cut mine to the ground just because when I'm cleaning up, it doesn't mean you have to. And when you cut it to the ground, it's more uh, herbaceous, you know, the wood will be green. Full sun, it grows in meadows um, up above the tall uh, grass. Goldenrod is um, a plant that can spread as well, so people are nervous about using it. Um, if you've got a larger area, definitely use it because it gives you such a show. It's not ragweed. It doesn't have allergens that uh, make you, you know, uh, have, have a reaction to it. So, but the, the seeds do spread by wind, though the birds like to eat them. And, um, and uh, it, it will slowly spread from underground as well. Evening primrose. I have this on my property. It came up um, voluntarily. It's considered a native, but also introduced, so you can see it either way. Um, it gets tall, about five feet tall. It's kind of, it's really nice to have towards the back where you don't have a lot of color that shows bright. It'll bring the background forward. And um, the flowers, if you're near them, they'll be lightly fragrant. This is another one that the moths, uh, some moths depend on um, because of the fragrance and the light color. They're attracted to it. Sunny, hot, and dry, perfect. So for yarrow, too, the same conditions. And um, it can be in the lawn and just be one of those natural uh, plants that grow with the grass or instead of grass. And, but if you let it grow, it will get about two feet tall. And, ha and as the flowers um, mature, you'll get a rosy tint to them. It's really pretty. People use this as an example as a landing uh, pad for butterflies. And that's true. Penstemons, there's a whole lot of them. Um, but, and so you've got a big choice of plants to use in this family. Um, I have trouble telling the difference between a salvia and a penstemon. And as you can see on this, the, um, the penstemons have tubes. They look like tubes more. And um, the salvia has smaller, shorter flowers. Both give great shows. Now, this big leaf lupin is a native here, and it does fantastic, too fantastic. You can see from this picture that it's, it's taking over an area, which will happen. So, you know, just plant it um, in a small area. You may even want to contain it because it does spread by rhizomes, not, not horribly aggressive. If you, if you can just put some rock around it or something that, that is dug into the ground, it should help. And um, um, the seeds um, can last up to two decades, they say in the soil. So, you know, if you're carrying around on your clothes or rototilling it to another area or something, you may have lupins where you don't want them. 
keep them out of grazing pastures because the whole plant is toxic. But the bees like it. I just threw in the big leaf maple because it's a great shade tree if you've got the space. You can tell that it's really big. <laughs> but um, you can trim it up. And like I uh, mentioned earlier, the, um, the bees love it in the spring. It smells good if you're near it. Snowberry grows under uh, maples and in the shade. Um, and um, they make berries in the winter. I wouldn't have that as a focal point, just kind of blend it in with the other plants and then just have the sparkles of white berries in the spring or in the uh, winter pop out. Columbine, the favorite. It gets tall. It gets 30 inches tall, and it can grow in sun, but, I, but shade, you know, light shade is good for it, too. Trillium is another shade plant. Now, this is called the spring of ephemeral, and there are other ones like uh, Bleeding Heart that do this, too, where they come in the spring when the leaves aren't there yet. They get the sunshine they need to warm the soil and emerge, and then by hot summer time, they, they disappear, mark the places um, so that you don't dig them up. Uh, don't pick the flowers on trillions because they need the flowers and leaves to uh, keep going. This is used um, in place of ferns a lot. This is a, a, an Oregon grape, um, Mahonia nervosa or repens, and um, it does the flowers. Um, it, it gets about a foot tall and about, I don't know, two and a half feet wide. Um, this is a ground cover that you can use, um, bunchberry. It's actually a dogwood as well. You can see by the four petals. Um, I just wanted to mention the cedar just because it is a native and um, it's, it's good for a windbreak. And um, it, this is a cedar that they use for um, porches and decks and things like that. It's not the redwood cedar that um, grows down in California that we need to protect. That's an extreme uh, uh, <laughs> landscape. You can do it if you have the space. So I have sources of plants and seeds. There's some listings of things around this area. This is Southwest Oregon, so I'm sorry that I don't have ones from other areas. Um, I do mention the, the watch out for noxious weeds. If you buy wallflower packages, sometimes they have things in there that you don't want. So buy specifically what you want, and then you can tell them from weeds as well. You know what's coming up. And um, I want to emphasize, do not dig in the wild because the plants belong there. And they, the Forest Service does give out permits, but... Um, it's for the areas that are dug out for roads and things like that. And so if you're going to dig a plant, dig it where it's not going to last a long time or they're going to be bulldozing it. And when you take cuttings, just I say occasional, it just means don't, don't shear a whole shrub or something like that. Keep the plant looking natural and have the new growth and the, and the fruit on it that, the, that it needs. And 5% is the rule, um, both for, for uh, cuttings and for seeds. And make sure you get permission to, to collect. Even when you're just collecting seeds, it's a good idea because you're on their property. These are some books. Um, if you guys, I know you guys are uh, about to leave, but... I'm going to stick around and, and um, hold up some books for you so you recognize them that I've used for this slideshow, and um, you, you may want to get because they're good resources for native plants. And there are a lot of websites. These are some good ones um, that, that uh, give good information. The, the book, one of the books is Real Garden, Gardens Grow Natives. And um, she's got a blog as well, which is pretty fun to, to uh, read. So um, that's another source. Uh, cities have lists of, of native plants that they have approved for their areas. Portland and Seattle both have lists. Um, I do believe Vancouver does too. And so that gives you an idea. Missouri Botanical Garden is a resource that we use a lot, even though it is in Missouri. 
um, a lot of the information is, is applicable. Okay. Some organizations, Washington Native Plant Society, join, get their magazine, it's great. And um, they've got a website that talks about native plants as well. And you can always ask us.